The next bit of audit strategy that we're going to look at is to consider the actual types of substantive testing that we might use. As I hope you remember from paper F8, there are five basic types of test that auditors use, whether substantive or controls testing. We have five different weapons to choose from. What we're going to do is take a quick look at those five types of test and consider when particular types of test might work best. So there we go, five basic types of audit test. Analytical procedures where we are comparing the figures in the financial statements with what we expected them to be, either by comparing with last year, budgets, other similar companies, things like that. Enquiry and confirmation where we ask somebody to confirm something in writing, don't forget. Much better evidence if it's written. Inspection where we look at things for example, assets to prove they exist. Observation, where we watch things, for example, an asset in use to prove to us that it works and it therefore has value. And recalculation, where we take numbers which have been calculated in some way and just check that the calculation has been done properly. Five basic types of test. Question is, are there any strategic choices to be made here? And the answer is yes. For example, consider enquiry and confirmation. How about enquiry and confirmation of management? Management representations, in other words. If you don't ask management, then you'll be asking someone else, a third party, an outside expert, for example. But let's just worry about management for the time being. There must be a fear that when management say, this is true, they're actually lying. And presumably in some situations they are more likely to lie than in others. For example, imagine that you're auditing a company, and this company has been approached by another company regarding a takeover bid. Presumably, in situations like this, the risk of your client's management looking to make the financial statements look better is much higher. And therefore, I think in situations like this, I would be less likely to accept management representations as evidence. I'd want something else. But to be honest, of the five items in this list, the one type of test that comes up on the exam the most is analytical procedures. Why is that? Well, analytical procedures are different to the rest of the tests on this list. And we can actually note that by looking at auditing standards. Because the last four are often referred to as the tests of detail. So they're separated out from analytical, which is not a test of detail, apparently. Well, it's not, is it? Because with analytical procedures, we look at a number in the financial statements, compare it with other information, and decide if it looks about right, rather than proving it completely. If it does look about right, we may well reduce any other testing we do on it. And of course, sometimes, checking that a number looks about right is actually a fairly quick process. I mean, imagine you went up to a cash point machine, an ATM, put your card in the hole in the wall and call up your bank account balance. The chances are you've got a fairly good idea of what that bank account balance should be. If the balance on the screen is pretty close to what you think it should be in your head, you probably won't bother checking it anymore. 
Obviously, if it's different, you'll have to go and find out what's gone wrong. Although, if it's too high, probably best to keep quiet if I were you and just take the money out. So, analytical procedures are potentially a very quick piece of audit work. Therefore, an exam question that gets asked a lot is, can you use analytical procedures a lot on this audit, or to what extent could you use them, and why? So let's now consider the main features of an audit that would allow you to use analytical procedures a lot. Firstly, analytical procedures don't work so well for new clients. The simple reason is that you don't understand the client as well as you will in future years, and analytical is all about understanding the relationships between numbers and events. Until you've got a really good understanding of those, it's difficult to use analytical that much. Of course, analytical procedures involve comparing what your client's accounts say this year with something else. So if you have a client that is fairly stable, it's doing similar things to last year, hasn't grown too much, hasn't shrunk too much, no major reorganizations, this year's figures should compare fairly well with last year's. It should be a fairly useful thing to look at. Also, if your client divides itself up into lots of different shops or divisions or subsidiaries, then it should be possible to compare the results of each section to show up where problems may exist. And if your client is in an industry where there are several other companies like yours, again, you can compare. Do bear in mind that an exam question might say something like, you are the auditor of the Millennium Dome in London. If you start writing in your answer, compare results with those of other similar companies, well, it's going to be fairly difficult to find another capital city that has a major venue built for the Millennium that's of a similar size and doing similar things. So just be careful when you say compare with similar companies. If it's a chain of supermarkets, well, there are plenty of those. But just consider that before you say it in the exam. So there we go. Analytical procedures tend to work well in those sorts of circumstances. And this comes up a lot on the exam, frequently within questions one and two in audit planning questions. So I'd make sure you're happy with that list. When we learn accountancy, there are two main documents we're trying to create. They were once called Profit and Loss Account and Balance Sheet. They have gone through various name changes over the years, and as we currently speak, they are the Statement of Comprehensive Income, which, let's face it, shows sales revenue minus costs equals profit, and the Statement of Financial Position, Assets and Liabilities and Reserves, or in other words, what used to be called a balance sheet. So two main documents full of numbers. Question is, when we audit, do we spend half our time on each of those, 
Or do audit firms tend to focus on one more than the other? And if so, why? Well, it will need to depend on each individual client, but on many audits, the focus tends to be on the assets and liabilities in the statement of financial position, or balance sheet if you prefer. The question is, why? Well, if you remember back to when you first learned bookkeeping and double entry, you may well have seen something like this. Often referred to as the accounting equation, this is basically the reason that a set of accounts adds up. Opening net assets, or the opening balance sheet, opening statement of financial position, increases as you make profits and would reduce if you made losses. If you draw capital out of the business, the balance sheet shrinks. Now, I've not bothered putting it into the equation, but if new capital is introduced, that would also lift net assets. Well, you learned this when looking at sole traders. We are now rather further down the line and looking at companies, and you cannot draw capital out of companies. Uh, it needs the directors to propose and the shareholders to accept dividends. But apart from that, the basics of this equation still work. So here's a theory for you. If the left-hand side must equal the right-hand side for the accounts to add up, do we actually need to check everything in this formula? Opening net assets is the same as last year's closing net assets. In other words, it's the statement of financial position, or balance sheet if you prefer, at the end of last year. That's last year's accounts, and you've audited those. So presumably, you're happy that those figures were okay. They're true and fair. Well, it's fairly easy to check this year's dividends. That's just one number. Don't forget, if the accounts add up, if the balance sheet balances, this equation must work. Which surely means, if you now check this year's profit there's no need to check closing net assets. It would have to be right. But we started this analysis by saying opening net assets, last year's closing net assets, has been checked and is okay. So maybe a more sensible thing to do is to audit the closing net assets this year and maybe Ignore the profit figure. The logic is, if every year you check that the closing net assets are correct, as long as last year's were also correct, the profit figure that makes the accounts balance has got to be right. Now, this concept of focusing on the assets and liabilities might sound a little confusing, or you might have heard that and said, that makes a lot of sense. And it pretty much works. It is a little simplistic, though. Bear in mind, all you've checked is the profit figure at the bottom. You haven't checked the individual revenue and expense figures, and there are all sorts of issues, important equations, ratios, that can be affected by changes in there. And there are tax issues as well, of course. But this does work. And most audit firms, on most audits, focus on the balance sheet, the assets and liabilities. And your examiner is likely to do that too. Most of the areas that come up on the exam, like intangible assets, provisions, tend to be focusing on assets and liabilities issues rather than revenues and costs. Now, if you did have a company that had a very complicated income statement, lots of odd expenses, lots of different categories of sales figures, 
but had a fairly simplistic set of assets and liabilities, balance sheet, maybe you'd change the focus. Now that's more a point of interest than anything else. I have yet to see this come up on the exam, so I'd be fairly surprised if you needed to mention this. But just bear in mind that most audit firms tend to focus on auditing the assets and liabilities rather than the revenue and the costs. Now, we've looked at what types of tests we're going to do, controls or substantive. We've then said substantive, what types of substantive test. We've then said, what area of the financial statements do we wish to focus on? Now, obviously, at some point, we need to pick individual things from the assets and liabilities, particular numbers and balances that worry us, the risks, in other words. But there's another piece of strategy we can consider as well. In a set of financial statements, you have debits and you have credits. But you knew that, I hope. The debits or credits could be too high or too low. As a result, auditors are basically checking four things. Debits are too high, debits are too low, credits are too high, credits are too low. Four things we need to check. Do we need to check all of them? Well, potentially, we don't. Consider this thought. Imagine we are testing debits to see if they are overstated. Too high, in other words. For example, existence tests are tests to see if things are too high. If they didn't exist, the numbers would be too high. Well, if a debit is too high, and assuming the accounts add up, either another debit is too low, or if a debit's too high, a credit must also be too high. Otherwise, the accounts wouldn't add up, would they? When you test things, you cannot just check a debit entry. To understand if the debit is right, you'd need to look at the credit to fully understand the transaction. Now, does this leave us with an interesting conclusion? Well, if when I check debits are too high... I'm also therefore checking to see if another debit is too low or to check if a credit is too high. And if overall I have to check debits too high, debits too low, credits too high, credits too low, well, looking at the screen as it currently stands, if I check that debits are too high, I've automatically checked that other debits are too low and that credits are too high. Three out of four. The only thing left to check is where the credits are too low. If I check every debit for too high, I'm automatically going to have to check every other debit for too low and every credit for too high. The only thing left, check credits for too low. So auditors maybe could focus on checking debits in one direction, too high, overvaluation and credits in the other direction, too low, undervaluation. And rather amazingly, have ended up checking both in the other direction automatically. Now, I've made this as simple as I can. It's called directional testing, and there are all sorts of issues involved in it, but the basic argument makes a lot of sense. It comes down to the fact that accountancy involves double entry. Every number that goes into the accounts creates another one, if you check one number, you're actually going to end up checking two. If you planned your audit correctly, halfway through checking the numbers, you'd realise you'd check the other half as well, and you'd go home. Question is, 
Is this what happens? Do audit firms focus on testing debits to see if they're too high and credits to see if they're too low? And the answer is pretty much yes. Auditors tend to focus on assets and liabilities, and when you test assets, you tend to focus on whether they are suffering impairments, in other words, they're overvalued, or whether they exist. In other words, are they overvalued? With credit balances, liabilities, your main concern is that the company is not recording them all. In other words, they're understated. So this concept of directional testing seems to make a certain amount of sense, and firms seem to be using it a bit in practice. So there we go. All sorts of interesting decisions that audit firms can take. Well, that's enough on audit strategy for the time being. What we need to move on to now is a very, very important area of the exam, and that is audit planning, and especially identifying risks. <laughs>